Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The animals of the Northern Hemisphere have survived the Grand Coupre extinction event that marked the end of the Eocene, but not without some quite noticeable casualties. Despite the fact that the end Eocene extinction seems to have had a lesser effect on North American faunas than in Eurasia, a number of American dinosaur lineages have disappeared for good. The large horned ceratopsids, which once roamed the continent during the late Cretaceous and throughout the Paleogene, have vanished. Their decline had already begun during the latter part of the Eocene, and appears to have been connected to the fragmentation of the subtropical forests across the Northern Hemisphere. For reasons that are less clear, Ornithomimosaurs survived the extinction event only to disappear from North America during the early Oligocene. The toothed troodontids are also gone, aside from their large herbivorous Nothrosaurid descendants. In this case, competition with the more derived Rhynchorostron troodontans seems to have led to their demise. This strange-looking animal is Clydeoceratops, a two-metre member of the basal ceratopsian clade Hippogryphoidea. This group has a frustratingly poor fossil record before the Middle Eocene, but phylogenetic studies conducted using living taxa have confirmed that they are very basal members of Ceratopsia. Indeed, they have been found to nest between Yin Long and Chaoyang Saurus on the phylogenetic tree of Ceratopsia. Quite where such a group was hiding during the Cretaceous period has not yet been ascertained, but it has been suggested that this poorly known late Cretaceous Micropachycephalosaurus was actually an ancestor of this lineage. The earliest members of Hippogryphoidia that are known from decent remains are the Histricosaurids, which suddenly appear during the early Eocene of North America at the Green River site. From incredibly well-preserved fossils, we know that Histricosaurids were small basal ceratopsians whose backs were covered in spiny quills and possessed strong forelimbs adapted to digging. The limited fossil material attributed to Clydeoceratops conforms to this image and suggests a stocky, herbivorous animal with a diet consisting of tough vegetation, roots, and tubers. During the Middle Oligocene, Histricosaurids or their close relatives would find their way to Asia, where the Hippogryphoidians would undergo a rapid burst of evolution, but that is a tale best left for another time. Other dinosaurs fared more poorly, and nonetheless saw their diversity cut by a significant margin. The large derived Tyrannosaurids were reduced to a single large genus, Vastatosaurus jacksoni, while the short-snouted Simotyrannosaurids would linger on until the Middle Oligocene. North American hadrosaurs were also hit hard, with several lineages succumbing to the pressure of a radically shifting climate. By the beginning of the Oligocene, only one group of hadrosaurs remained, the balloon-nosed Canolophines. These herbivores first appeared during the Middle Oligocene and were initially quite rare and modestly sized. However, this status actually gave them an advantage over their larger and more numerous cousins. With any sort of competition out of the way, the Canolophines would go on to produce a spectacular radiation during the Oligocene and Miocene. Initially, it was not clear why Tyrannosaurs and Hadrosaurs survived in North America while completely disappearing from Asia and Europe. More recent research has indicated that the already stressed and vulnerable dinosaur faunas of Eurasia were pushed even further by a couple of asteroid impacts that struck Siberia at the very end of the Eocene. These impacts were nowhere near as devastating as the KPG impact from our own timeline, mainly because they struck inland continental crust rather than shallow ocean. However, there is no doubt that these impacts led to a more severe extinction event in Eurasia than in North America. An example of one of these survivors was the genus Barnoskia, known from several specimens recovered from the early Oligocene Cedar Creek site of Colorado. This 8 meter long herbivore possessed a confusing set of anatomical features. The long, back-swept head crest immediately puts one in mind of a Lambiosaurine, while the overall structure of the skull, beak and teeth are more reminiscent of Sauralophines. It was for these reasons that the Canolophines in total initially proved very difficult to classify, with opinions differing among paleontologists as to which group of hadrosaurs these animals were more closely related to. 
The consensus now seems to be that the Canalophines were descended from Sauralophine ancestors, and that the Lambiosaurine-like traits were examples of convergent evolution. Whatever their heritage, these hadrosaurs quickly became the most common large herbivores in Oligocene North America, alongside the Novoceratopsians, diversifying into a wide array of forms and only disappearing at the start of the Pliocene. For some of the survivors, the situation remained very much business as usual. Dromaeosaurs continued on as they had during the Eocene with little change, with the small beaked Rhynchorostron troodontans were also beginning to diversify and oviraptorosaurs were going from strength to strength. With competition having been reduced, the increasingly carnivorous Ochisoraptorid oviraptorosaurs were growing larger and more numerous, while the bulky omnivorous brontavids reached up to 7 metres in length. Oviraptorosaurs went through a massive diversification event in the Eocene. Indeed, the ancestors of most modern representatives of this lineage had appeared by the end of that period. In North America, the Ochisoraptorids, descendants of Asian oviraptorids, first appeared during the early Eocene as small generalised omnivores, but, by the end of the period, had begun to develop heavier skulls and beaks adapted for shearing flesh. The Ochisoraptorids survived the Grand Coupre extinction event with minimal losses and continued into the Oligocene with little change. During the middle of the period, the bulky, scavenging Simotyrannosaurids died out, leaving the mid-sized predator-slash-scavenger niche with a void to be filled. The already carnivorous Ochisoraptorids quickly moved into this niche and became major predators up to 8 metres in length. They regularly scavenged from carcasses, incorporated the occasional tuba or root into their diet when times got tough, as well as taking live prey. While later Oligocene and Miocene members of this group were rather large animals, early Oligocene representatives, such as Mesoraptor, were smaller, between 2 and 3.5 metres in length. Mesoraptor acrinathus was a 3 metre long mesocarnivore that would have preyed on small ornithischians, lizards and mammals, while also supplementing its diet with fruit, fungi and other plant material. A good comparison from our own world might be the coyote or African jackals. With the extinction of the larger, dome-headed pachycephalosaurs and rhododromids, the many smaller, more basal lineages that began appearing over the course of the Eocene took on a more prominent role in the Oligocene. The small ankylotarsiform pachycephalosaurs readily moved into the small, speedy herbivore niche vacated by the rhododromids while the Thessalosaurids continued to move towards an increasingly semi-aquatic lifestyle. Perhaps the dinosaur group that benefited most from the end Eocene extinction event were descendants of Leptoceratopsids, the Novoceratopsians. With the complete absence of large ceratopsids, these animals rapidly grew in size and diversity, convergently re-evolving many of the same physical characteristics as their deceased cousins. Thus, the development of elongated neck frills and brow horns emerged, and, if you were to glimpse one of these Novoceratopsians from a distance, it would appear almost identical to a large ceratopsid such as Triceratops or Centrosaurus. However, in addition to occasionally possessing brow horns above the eyes, these ceratopsians also developed distinctive jugal horns used for display and species recognition. By the end of the Oligocene, up to eight genera of these animals roamed across North America and would eventually go on to colonise Asia as well. Apart from the dinosaurs, many other animal groups were not so heavily affected by the Grand Coupre extinction event. North American mammal diversity remained relatively intact from the Eocene, with the loss of a small number of specialised arboreal chimolestans and metatherians. Multituberculates remained as diverse and ubiquitous as ever, occupying all sorts of rodent-like niches, including burrowing herbivores, the Tania laboids, tiny mouse-sized generalists, the Viridiogallids, and hopping insectivores, the Mechanomyids. The Tinodontids occupied chipmunk, squirrel, and dormouse-like ecological roles. Metatherians remained essential components of North America's mammal faunas, 
and range from arboreal insectivores to badger-sized terrestrial predators. The carnivorous deltatheroid finally disappeared at the Eocene or Ligocene boundary, leaving the role of mammalian predator open to the didelphodontids. While ancestrally long-bodied and otter-like, during the Oligocene these animals radiated out into a number of body plans, including heavily built wolverine-like scavengers and smaller mustelid-like predators that hunted multituberculates. In the trees scampered many generalist opossum-like metatherians, including the pediomyids and alphodontians. Herpetotheroids appear to have been more terrestrial and seem to have resembled small dasurids in appearance. Eutherians were also common, but occupied more exclusively terrestrial niches. Judging by their modern descendants, eutherians were probably mostly nocturnal animals, while the metatherians were more active for short periods throughout the day and night. Chimolestans were fairly diverse, ranging from tiny shrew-like animals to semi-aquatic piscivores. Taniodonts rooted in the undergrowth and chewed through tough vegetation, while one group, the Sculprodontids, had evolved an almost rodent-like tooth arrangement with elongated incisors. The Zalamdolested descendants, the Anthracogallids, were starting to adapt to a more herbivorous way of life. Zalested relatives, the Trigonomylids, were becoming slightly larger on average and were among the biggest terrestrial mammals of the time, being the size of small deer. Members of the clade Hemiplacentalia, the sister group of placental mammals, were represented by small generalists not too dissimilar to their Cretaceous relatives Protungulatum and Purgatorius. True placentals are rare, with only a couple of genera known from Western North America. Both of these were members of Boreoeutheria and were long-tailed arboreal omnivores. The remains of other reptiles, pterosaurs and crocodiloids, are noticeably rarer than those of mammals and dinosaurs. However, we do know that a diversity of squamates inhabited Oligocene North America. In all, polyglyphanodontians, iguanians, skinks, amphisbanians, snakes, anguimorphs and more were present. Bits and pieces of asdarkoid pterosaurs have also been recovered from terrestrial deposits. But again, these are scrappy and poorly known. We have a much better understanding of the pelagic pterosaurs that lived along the coasts and over the open seas. Pteranodontids and nyctosaurs dominated these niches, with some possessing wingspans of 10 metres or more. Thanks for watching, everyone. Next week, I'll be covering the unique Asian ursid, the sloth bear. Thank you for listening, everyone, and I hope to see you again soon. We're almost at 300 subscribers now, and to that I could only say a big thank you. See you again soon. Cheerio.